Oh, hi. What's up, Goth Gamer Nation? I was just reading a book. That shit out of here. Uh, today we're doing a video about the second Alice game. Done a video about that first one. It's a long time ago. Uh, I don't recommend going back to look at it because uh, it's a long time ago and you know. <laughs> but anyway, hope you're doing all right. Hope you're staying strong. Let's get that video going so we can all get back to gaming. Alice Madness Returns is a third person action horror platformer mall goth revival 20% off all Emily the Strange Merch Sale Simulator, and the direct sequel to 2000's American McGee's Alice. It was developed by Spicy Horse and published by EA in 2011 for PC, PS3, and Xbox 360. This is a franchise that is near and dear to my heart. American McGee's Alice is one of my favorite games and a game that captured my imagination and informed or heightened my appreciation of video games. Uh, but being a fan of this character and this world can be a uh, double-edged blade. On one hand, I think this series was and still is a great idea. A great idea for storytelling, for game design, art design. I have never doubted that Alice is a deep, deep well to draw from. On top of the basic elevator pitch of twisting a well-known children's story into a Victorian psychological horror story, with Wonderland acting as an allegorical coping mechanism, it's already a story that perfectly lends to game design. A surreal adventure with loosely conjoined vignettes in a world full of games and game imagery. With mechanics already mapped out, everyone knows if you eat me, I get bigger. Now, hang on a the reality you're stuck with, however, is that you'd be hard pressed to find a franchise with more unmet potential and more failed, abandoned, stagnating, or canceled projects than Alice and the output of its creator, American McGee. The fact that American McGee's Alice even got a sequel is nothing short of divine providence, and even that took over a decade to come to fruition. That first Alice game was received well, sold decently, and talk of a sequel was near immediate, but work was instead being funneled towards a project called American. And McGee's Oz, a spin-off that would give the series of Oz books the Alice treatment, a property ripe for a grim psychological reinvention as evidenced in the 1985 film Return to Oz, where Dorothy instead of Alice is gaslit about her imaginary escapism dimension, though this interpretation of Oz as a dream is an invention of the film industry, and in the books Oz is an actual place full of death and all manner of horrors. What the fuck is that? Yeah, actually, she's kind of cute. Around this time began the persisting talks of an Alice film adaptation that would be bounced around from rights holder to rights holder, be announced, go dark, and then re-announced ad nauseum. At one point, it was in the hands of Wes Craven, who wanted to turn it into a computer animated movie with Christina Ricci playing Alice. Then it was going to be a live action movie with Sarah Michelle Gellar as Alice. In the meantime, American McGee's Oz, which was purportedly half finished, was abandoned after their financier, Info Graham's Atari went bankrupt. In 2004, a game bearing McGee's name called Scrapland was released, which he did not work on and admits his name was used as a marketing tool as he worked at the game's publisher at the time. Yeah, which, uh, which worked on me. I, I bought it because it had his name on it. And um, I couldn't tell you a goddamn thing about it because it was that forgettable and I never finished it. You got me though. You deceived me. I hope that pleases you. Six years after the release of Alice, McGee would finally develop a new game, one he dreamed up while stuck in LA traffic, called appropriately enough Bad Day LA. This game would prove to be a uh, catastrophic oopsie, a big ol' oh dang, I pissed myself, and far from the celebrated follow-up to what had now become a cult classic. Bad Day LA would be called one of the worst games ever made, and a spectacular failure in almost every facet of its execution. That honk is jacked up. Crazy shit, yo. In 2007, a planned re-release of American Mickey's Alice, along with its sequel, were shelved by EA, who had apparently hinged their decision to pursue these releases on the success of the Alice film, which was once again stagnating. This is also the year American McGee moved to China to start Spicy Horse, with their first project being 2008's American McGee's Grimm, a game he deigned worthy of possessing, as the previous two were only American McGee Presents. Grimm was 
an episodic game centered around corrupting the stories from Grimm's fairy tales with gameplay reminiscent of Katamari Damacy. This was originally released as a Game Tap exclusive, a short-lived online game service that fell apart due to many developers removing their games from the platform, as well as technical issues, missing content, and an intentionally frustrating unsubscribe process. Since then, it has found its way onto platforms like Steam and GOG. In 2009, EA finally announced the sequel to Alice, then titled The Return of American McGee's Alice, and in an odd mix-up, a fan-made stop-motion trailer for a theoretical Alice sequel was put online around the same time, so many news outlets confused this as an official teaser for the game despite no actual information about the game being released other than its title and the fact that it was being made. This artist would later be tapped when a short film project called Alice Otherlands was being put together. So that's fun. Throughout 2010, more information and trailers would be released, including its final title, Alice Madness Returns. On release in 2011, the game was received mostly positively, with the general consensus being that it's a game full of creativity and imagination, but weighed down by bloated, repetitive gameplay and odd bugs and quirks that probably could have been ironed out with more time in the oven, a sentiment that American McGee himself would agree with several years later. Unfortunately, Madness Returns was most slept on and quickly swept under the rug. A cruel but unsurprising conclusion to an 11 year wait. An 11 year wait for a follow up to a game EA has yet to re-release or even make available on their own digital storefront, making American McGee's Alice effectively abandonware. As a half-hearted compromise, they included the original game as DLC when you pre-ordered Madness Returns from Origin, but it's not hard to find innumerable reviews and forum posts full of people confused about how to unlock the first entry after being given keys that don't work because the game isn't hosted there anymore. I'm sure EA simply existing and controlling the IP continues to hamstring the franchise, but waiting until a niche PC exclusive in a now retro game genre was all but publicly forgotten to reboot it and sell it for $60 undoubtedly did it no favors. I'd also imagine its close proximity to the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland film precipitated in Alice fatigue among some. Two, Alice but kind of dark themed properties. One, a soulless cash grab with outdated graphics that vandalizes an otherwise enjoyable story with laborious combat sequences and no controller support. Uh, and the other one is Madness Returns. While Madness Returns is technically a direct sequel to American McGee's Alice, it's not entirely required that you play both to be brought up to speed for this one. They both tackle two different conflicts involving the same series of events, but if anything, playing the original will just better acclimate you to the way this interpretation of Wonderland works and the sorts of themes that will be explored. I guess I should say, spoilers for American McGee's Alice. I am talking about its sequel, so I guess you might have anticipated that. On one hand, it's a very old game game now. You've had time. But on the other, it's a hard game to stumble on and build a new audience with as it's currently submerged under the avaricious behemoth that is its publisher. One that in all likelihood doesn't even remember it exists. Getting the game to run is bothersome, but not impossible. Like a lot of things, gamers figured it out. Haven't figured out how to not harass women, but you got an old game working, so that's something. But don't for one goddamn second think that you can come inside the house you're gonna stay outside in the muck, in the grime, where it's cold. This series takes place in late Victorian era London and follows a variation of the Alice from Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and its sequel Through the Looking Glass. It diverges from the familiar and cheerfully whimsical stories we know when a house fire kills her family and leaves her in a state of catatonia. That seemingly no barbaric medical treatment could rouse her from. That is until, at the age of 18, she is drawn back into Wonderland, albeit a twisted reflection of it that is full of violence and suffering. What was once an absurdist playground for an overactive imagination has been disfigured and corrupted by Alice's trauma and survivor's guilt. Aided by the familiar cast of the book and opposed by grim proxies for characters from the waking world, Alice learns that the only way Wonderland can be repaired and thus her mental health repaired is to defeat 
defeat the Queen of Hearts, the personification of her guilt. So Alice's journey is in part about overcoming these things, but also generally about growing up and learning to confront your problems. With the Queen defeated, Wonderland is restored and Alice regains consciousness. American McGee has stated that he always imagined Alice as a trilogy, which is a little weird to buy considering how much the first Alice game is a neatly contained standalone little story. It has one substantial thing to say, it says it, and the rest is icing. Madness Returns picks up a year after Alice's partial recovery and release from Rutledge Asylum, the institution that held her and likely exacerbated her condition. Now a 19 year old, she resides at an orphanage, and though she hasn't visited Wonderland since, she is still plagued by strange hallucinations and moments where the line between reality and Wonderland seem to bleed into one another. Alice herself doesn't seem to be too concerned about this, but her psychiatrist, Dr. Bumby is, and he uses hypnosis on her, as well as other children in the orphanage, in an attempt to erase traumatic memories instead of confronting them. He attempts to use a reboot of Alice's Wonderland as a screen obscuring her past, but Alice struggles to accomplish this as the memories always seem to claw their way back. Unlike Alice 2000, Madness Returns lets us spend a decent amount of time walking around London, showing us a cruel and filthy waking world that you'd understandably want to do anything to get away from. Everyone from street urchins to bobbies barking at you in vulgarly, obscenely British accents. Hello dearie, come to show it's the Bristol cities, eh? Boy! Don't walk away from me, you there are a handful of characters that sort of look out for her, but most of them are out to take advantage of her, like Pris Whitless, a nurse from Rutledge that extorts money from her by using her false confession about the fire that killed her family against her. There's also Wilton Radcliffe, her family's former lawyer, that seems to gaslight and manipulate Alice in an attempt to collect her inheritance. Nan Sharp is probably the only character that truly cares about her. Before the fire, she was her nanny, but she now runs a local brothel called the Mangled Mermaid, an establishment that's sort of terrorized by a pimp named Jack Splatter, which may be this universe's parallel to Jack the Ripper. I think the grimness of this world is illustrated really well with how drab and desaturated everything is, and that's punctuated by Alice's dark, soot-stained outfit. So when Alice begins to break down in front of Pris and is suddenly dragged back into Wonderland, the transition feels really powerful because it's just bursting with color and light. And you don't really see this in the original all that much, but she's initially taken to Wonderland proper. It appears to be a functioning Wonderland for a while at least. It's not long before Alice is once again forced to take up arms and defend herself in Wonderland, but this time the enemy comes in the form of creatures born out of a black ooze that erupts from the ground called Ruin. Its arrival heralded by the Infernal Train, a personification of Alice's rapidly declining mental well-being. In the previous game, Wonderland had been twisted into a grim dark shadow of its former self, but now it seems to be crumbling apart altogether. Every place this train visits leaves a trail of death and decay, so Alice sets out to find who set the train in motion and how it can be stopped while hopping back and forth between London and Wonderland, and while hopping in between cute dresses. Eh, yeah, some of them are just okay. What's going on there? There's a lot more story this time around, so there are things to spoil, and if you'd rather not have them spoiled for you, you can feel free to skip to this time. But I'm warning you, you're missing out on premium content ahead, and if you skip it now, you know, I don't know how long YouTube is going to allow my channel to exist, thus allowing me the ability to survive, which is always a disquieting thing to think about. Anyway, I'll see you after the jump. Uh, I think I'm going to... And go for a walk or something. Uh, hello? Friend or foe? Pardon? We haven't got all day. Uh, friend, I guess. For now, unless you're selling something. Not at all. <sighs> well, that's a goddamn relief. You know, I'm so sick of these targeted ads everywhere I look. It's really unsettling knowing that Google is keeping track of the things I buy, and then I'll just be browsing Reddit, and all of a sudden they're hawking me zip ties, Mountain Dew, and hydrochloric acid. Not for the first or last time, I'll wager. Tell me about it. When does it stop? We gotta stand up to these corporations, man. That's the way, girl. These capitalist pigs are commodifying our fucking data, our personalities, through surveillance. Did you say a pirate thing? 
Hey, listen, you gotta tell me if you're a pirate. This guy's a fucking pirate, holy shit. Hold anchor and heave to, men! It's the wide and glorious main for us! Wow. Ooh! That reminds me, I gotta order some more pirate's booty from Hold Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Alice's first couple attempts to find information about the train yield very little results. The Hatter offers information in exchange for help regaining control of his factory from Dormouse and March Hare, but doesn't uphold his end of the bargain and instead seems to lose all coherency as the infernal train barrels by and this area of Wonderland collapses on top of him. Alice wakes up as she's being dragged out of the Thames, which seems to imply that when she collapsed in front of Pris, her solution was to dump her body in the river, I guess. She struggles, struggles? Does she struggle? She stumbles over to the mangled mermaid to talk with Nan, but interrupts a confrontation between her and Jack Splatter that ends with him knocking Alice out and setting fire to the brothel, triggering a nautical-themed area of Wonderland where Alice attempts to confront the walrus and the carpenter about the train, but they trick her and attempt to keep her trapped, believing her to be the cause of the train, and it's because she's being misled. One important detail about this game's story that, if you're coming straight from the first one, might disorient you for a moment moment is that Alice has been retconned to have had an older sister named Lizzie. She is one of the voices you hear and the memories you collect throughout the game that play brief snippets of dialogue from Alice's past. I mean, I suppose she could have always been there and just wasn't relevant to the plot of the first game. After all, that game was really focused on Alice and didn't have much in the way of side characters. But at the start of this one, Alice sees a portrait of her family. Sometimes it's like an aunt or a babysitter, but there are some versions that give her an unnamed older sister that's typically seen reading a boring book with no pictures. Hey, so I guess she's never really all that relevant in any depiction of her. From here forward, the line between memory and wonderland and reality gets really hard to track and the expository cutscenes become far less frequent. There are long stretches where it feels like the memory collectibles are where the most substantial bits of information come from. The explanation given to Alice about the fire and its origins begins to clearly conflict with her returning memories. Alice 2000 seems to depict the official story. Dinah, her cat, knocked over an oil lamp and Alice was only able to escape by jumping out the window. The more Alice recovers from the past that Dr. Bumby worked to erase, she realized that Dinah was in her room that night and the only oil lamp left burning was one in the hallway. Furthermore, her sister never slept with her door locked, yet she was found in her locked room, dead and unburned, leading Alice to believe someone killed her and then set fire to the house to destroy the evidence. Alice goes through several part memory, part hallucination, part wonderland trips detailing her treatment and diagnosis after the fire, and it's around here that you start getting clued into the undeniably uh, just ghastly and heavy place this train is headed. There are several memory collectibles that hint at the grim reality of what this game and even the last game have secretly been about this whole time. And it's, it's not about collecting black rubber bracelets and how fucking tight the Queen of the Damned soundtrack was. A handful of memories reveal that Dr. Bumby, who was at the time a student being tutored by Lizzie and Alice's father, had on more than one occasion creeped out Lizzie, made her uncomfortable, been overly physical with her, and even followed her into a bathroom once. She told her parents not to have him visit again, so he began stalking her. On the night of the fire, Alice begins to recall a hazy memory of seeing a centaur in the hallway and hearing her sister talking in her sleep, but this is revealed to have been a screen memory, something she invented to avoid the knowledge that the doctor broke into their home, assaulted and murdered Lizzie, and locked the door behind him before setting fire to the house, keeping the key to her room as a grim memento that he later used in his hypnosis sessions. While Bumby's treatment was slowly destroying Wonderland, its inhabitants were desperately trying to get Alice to understand and process the horror she was too young 
and psychologically fragile to confront not just what happened to Lizzie, but herself and most of the children at the orphanage who were all undergoing the same treatment, plucked off the street, sold off to be abused and then sent back to Bumby to have their brains scrambled again, turned into mindless dolls. Alice is finally clued in at the wasteland of abandoned toys where insane and tortured children plead with Alice to stop the doll maker, the one stealing the children's memories and the mastermind behind the ruin and the train, which looks an awful lot like Bumby. These same children appear in the first game as mostly set dressing, but their inclusion has been sort of brought full circle. As Wonderland is all but dead, Alice struggles with the guilt of inaction. Though she herself was made half insane by Bumby, the realization that all of this suffering was taking place under her nose and she had retreated to Wonderland instead of doing something about it sets her into a bit of a spiral. Concurrently in London, Alice confronts Bumby, who waits for the arrival of a new orphan at a train station. Having fully recovered her memories, Alice unloads on him and he makes no attempt to hide his true nature, knowing that Alice's reputation is tarnished and nobody would believe any accusations against the social architect Angus Bumby. I mean, yeah, he's got a point. He did an effective job taking a frying pan to her brain eggs and the past couple days of Alice muttering to herself in the streets getting thrown in jail and being fished out of a river aren't a good look. So if she wants to build a case against this guy, I... Alice, satisfied that her sister and the orphans have been avenged, walks out of the train station and is greeted by a bizarre conjoining of Wonderland and London. The reality of this and the mental state of Alice is left ambiguous. But I always thought it very intriguing that before Alice pushes Bumby, he does seem to notice that she's wearing her Wonderland dress, and he looks rattled by that. Yeah, but let's see it one more time. Mm-hmm. I've always liked that they really give him a plain poor man's death. In a world filled with such vibrant imagination and full of grotesque imagery representing the horrors of abuse and Alice's barbaric treatments from the asylum to the orphanage and the dread of Victoriana, this motherfucker just gets nudged in front of a train with very little pomp and circumstance. Yeah, I have issues with it, but I think the story of Madness Returns is structurally surprisingly good. I think this very cleverly builds off the first game and tackles some intense themes that add a lot of weight to the world and recontextualizes a lot of stuff from the first game. Obviously, it's with some measure of unease that I say I enjoy this story. It's a tough thing to depict and treat respectfully, uh, but I feel like its heart is in the right place and it displays a modicum of subtlety, so it's not going to outright drop the R word or the P word, uh, but it will have a sign pointing to the crotch of a doll which is pretty vivid in its own way. In the art book, they make a note acknowledging how conceptually disturbing this is, adding, when we can make the player feel they're doing something wrong, we know we've gotten the design right. So yeah, mission accomplished there. He definitely hesitated when I was confronted with that. I don't wanna go in there. And maybe I'm just projecting my theories onto it. Um, I haven't found much in writing that shares this thought, but I do get the sense that American McGee was intentionally sort of confronting the controversial life of Lewis Carroll, or the rumors of. I don't think it would be a huge leap to point out that Carroll also fancied himself a respectable high society type and allegedly developed an inappropriate infatuation with the real Alice's older sister, the, the fact that American chose to give his Alice the real Alice's surname, Little, spurs my presumption there, I suppose. And you know, there's also the fact that Carol spent years photographing nude children, but like, that could mean anything. Authors and academics seem really divided on whether or not Carol was a creep, uh, but I don't know. He was a British man in the 1800s, and uh, well, what other proof do you want? The odds he was embroiled in some kind of Victorian era pizza gate are pretty high to me. Sure, he could not be a creep. I would like that, but you know what? I'm not gonna die on that hill. I'm gonna die in the walls of a home that has a network of spy holes, typically around the cutout eyes of antique paintings, and I'll only be found once, uh, I don't know, they, uh, develop a fly infestation. It's kind of hard to defend a guy when I'm pretty sure just looking up his photography will add you to some kind of FBI watch list.
Uh, American McGee's Alice didn't actually need anything else, and it is of an era and genre that doesn't typically require some deep, you know, lore-rich narrative. So the further we got out from the first game, I was increasingly skeptical of how they were gonna make this work. So when I first played Alice Madness Returns, it was coming from an odd state of mind, perhaps a heightened state of nostalgia. It's like finding a band shirt in the back of your closet, but it's a band you really liked for like a summer, and then you just kind of forgot. Like, oh yeah, I did used to listen to the Birthday Massacre, huh? Hmm. Weird. Is that still me? Am I still this person? Probably. But I was still pleasantly surprised with how much Madness Returns seem seems to go for it, and how much soul it retains. It has an intense story it wants to tell, and one concerning things you typically don't see approached in such a widely released game. Much like the game's distinct visual style, its story is clearly a lovingly crafted part of it. It's something that was sat on and marinated for a long time, taking what was already a pretty fucked up story, and not only substantially upping the end, but it lets us sit in reality for a while, a reality that is often just as unpleasant as the more nightmarish areas in Wonderland, and because of that you can further divorce Wonderland from Alice and get a good look at the character and the severity of what she endures. While I am technically satisfied with where we leave the world of Alice, there's a lot working against Madness Returns. What I feel damages the story a lot is honestly how bloated its gameplay is. How long we spend platforming and fighting enemies in these repetitive obstacle courses, in between not just cutscenes but character moments and dialogue, and often attempts at filling in the blank space feel really half-assed. I felt as though you could sense phantom content while playing it. There's so much time spent not thinking about the story or the characters, and then they toss you these memories which amount to like a sentence or two. And it's not enough to keep me consistently engaged with the plot. Whenever Alice or another character would say something, I'd be stirred out of a gamer daze and remember that there was a story going on the whole time. Even just the way that scenes are constructed seems kind of flimsy, and every once in a while I'd get the impression that there was some kind of connective visual or transition that was just missing. Sometimes they go all out and make the transition from one part of Wonderland to another look quite beautiful and stylized, and then other times it's just this hard cut to a different location. Maybe even Alice has a different outfit. There's no discussion or animation welcoming you to this new area. It just feels like you have spawned in Red Queen Zone. Uh, the cat, who is like the franchise mascot, doesn't have much to do in this game. In American McGee's Alice, you always feel like he's your guide. He's like a consistent presence and his dialogue is sharply written. Here's a riddle. Quinn is a croquet mallet like a billy club, I tell you, whenever you want it to be. And then he fucking explodes and it's a bummer. You feel his loss because he was like the angel on your shoulder the whole way through. This time around, he shows up far less often, and when he does, he rarely has anything artful or interesting to add. Be careful, Alice. Observe, learn, and react. That's, that's, that's all you got for me? Look at the pearls of wisdom on Jiminy fucking Cricket over here. <laughs> Alright, I'll take that into consideration. Idiot! He just seems absent for long stretches, and when he does show up, he's, he's got nothing worth to say. A lot of this does extend to gameplay, so I'll try to focus on the narrative, but I think changing the enemy created like a black hole in the world of Alice. That removes a lot of opportunities for fun. In the previous game, Wonderland itself was the enemy, so they really went all out warping the familiar characters and iconography to be menacing and creepy. In Madness Returns, the enemy is this external force that has nothing to do with Wonderland. It's this new set of creatures that doesn't really require you to further plunder the source material for fun ways to corrupt it. So while I do think the idea of the ruin is still solid, and some of the black, goopy monsters look cool, it's not nearly as fun to me as turning Wonderland into this oppressive gauntlet where once friendly characters are now out to get you. Still, there are brief moments of brilliance that quickly get swallowed up by tedium. I wish you could just compress this game like an accordion so it moves fast 
faster and felt more consistent because this should be a six hour game max and it somehow doubled that and then some. It's really a shame because there's so much good in it. There's so much fun dialogue, design and detail and it still has this strong sense of identity and finds a worthy reason to revisit Alice. Every random bit of decoration in this world feels as though it was carefully considered and put there with good reason. Every line of dialogue penned with purpose. It, it just also feels like, much like uh, Lewis Carroll's diary after his death, there are pages that may have had substantial content that have been mysteriously removed. Alright, let's boot up the old Alice 2 here. Yeah? What's this? Uh, do I have an account with whatever this is? Uh, I guess I could create one. Hmm. No, I'm pretty sure I am online. Huh. Maybe the Steam page has some info on- Oh! It's, it's not even- It's not even- I can't fucking believe this. This is embarrassing. This is the most cringe thing I've done on this channel. Madness Returns was sort of an early throwback to N64 era 3D platforming and collectathon type games, a genre that was soon to have a resurgence. So it plays very linearly, where there are levels and you run through these obstacle courses of floating and moving platforms, and they slowly ramp up the complexity of these with platforms that are mostly invisible, pressure plates that hold up a platform for a limited amount of time, and enemies that shoot at you to knock you off. This whole facet of gameplay is competently put together, and Alice has a lot of mobility, so it feels like with quick thinking, you have a lot you could utilize to overcome anything, like her triple jump and her glide and dash. Oh, oh, oh! Nice! Hell yeah, dude. I'd go further and say most of the basic gameplay loop in Madness Returns is solid. It's got good bones, good skin too, but that's sort of all it is. This is like a skeleton with a loose-fitting, decaying skin suit that stumbles around trying to stuff all manner of garbage and detritus inside itself in hopes of feeling like a real person. So I empathize with it a great deal. I think where this falls apart for not only platforming, is that after the first maybe three areas, it begins to rapidly feel artificially extended, as if it's run out of tricks and just doubles back on the same assortment of puzzles and challenges until the end in hopes that the new coats of paint will fool you. But it does feel like you are repeating yourself, especially in levels like the Oriental Grove, which apart from thematically and narratively having the flimsiest reason for existing, feels endless, and even their mild attempts to spice up gameplay with 2D platforming segments and slide puzzles and rhythm games all feel tiresome. I think because they aren't used as a treat. They aren't a small special surprise. They are just a thing they can continuously pull out when the game feels like you've done enough pulling switches and stabbing dolls. I do feel like there should be things that shake up gameplay and offer respite and change from the game's main loop, but the interchangeable and repeated use of them feels like stepping off a rake only to walk into another bigger one. I had these fond memories of the game that I soon realized were confined to the first couple hours and invariably I find myself just wishing that a level would end so I could see something different. At the very least, a new dress. I fucking live for the dresses. Yes! Put a little doll head on that! Fuck! This is something I never thought I'd advocate for, but Alice 2000 did have something that served to shake up gameplay pretty effectively, and that was boss fights. Something that is conspicuously missing from Madness Returns. In the place of boss fights are these bigger, arena-type fights where you fight both regular enemies and larger enemies simultaneously. And look, these are fun! I will maintain that the combat is generally fun. And these are fun, but there's nothing special about these fights. I'm not going to be able to remember them or differentiate them because you're still doing the same thing you've been doing. You're just doing it at the end of a level. The fact that they subvert the setup for a boss fight at least twice tells me this was a conscious decision to say, look, we know this is ordinarily where you'd fight a boss. We get it. We've been doing this long enough to know when you drop the boss fight on him. So like, why bother? You get the idea, there there was a boss. Let's get this show on the road. I don't know. What, do you want to fight it? Sometimes you crash, you get kind of sick, and that's scary. Here's this guy again, but this time there's 
two of them. It just seems so fixated on having you do the same thing multiple times. I remember having my interest peaked when they introduced the snail shell challenge rooms, which initially just asks you a riddle. And if you get the right answer, you get a piece of a rose. And when you collect four of these, you get a health upgrade. This was kind of a fun little idea. Played with the themes of the world of Wonderland. Uh, but then in the rest of them, you just fight waves of enemies until the timer's up, which is like, guys, that's what I've been doing this whole time. What, am I gonna take a break to fight more guys? Oh, man. It would in itself be a spoiler, so I can't show it in this section, but there is one boss fight in the game, uh, and it's pretty fun. It's a fun change of pace, and it displays that they can easily dream up serviceable boss fights. But it being at the end does make it feel like too little too late. Like, wait, way too late. Like, by the time I got to that boss fight, I was like, no, it's fine. I don't, I don't even want a boss fight. Yeah. It's, I... It's fine, like, you were too busy for the boss fight. I'll get real c about it. For the most part, I do enjoy the combat. It's nothing groundbreaking, but I think it can be somewhat frantic and mostly satisfying. All the weapons have a good feel to them. They all have their own sort of sense of impact and weight, and there is a decent amount of enemy variety, each with their own weaknesses, methods of guard breaking, and moments of vulnerability. So it's easy to remain engaged, especially when they start mixing them up because it begins to feel like a puzzle all its own, where you have an enemy that needs to be taken down at a certain moment using a ranged attack while one of the tankier melee enemies is barreling towards you. It's, it's pretty fun. Locking onto enemies is often very crucial, but this allows for not infrequent moments of the camera being stuck in an unhelpful position, and you can get a little turned around. Outside of combat, I don't enjoy how the camera and the uh, mouse acceleration works. It feels balanced for use with a controller in that kind of sluggish, soft locking way where it wants to do most of the work for you, so you really have to fight with it if you're used to a higher sensitivity. In a game where you often have to react quickly to right a jump or to dash to a different platform, not having complete control of that can feel pretty frustrating. There is a parallel to Alice's rage ability in the first game called Hysteria, which you activate when your health reaches one rose, and much like rage, I never really found much use for it. It seems like a safety net in a game that wasn't all that difficult enough to require it. Yeah, but it could be that I'm just like uh, amazing at, at gaming. Ah, shit. <laughs> Alright, I'll take that into consideration. I do like that there is clear intention to make exploration a focus by littering levels with hidden collectibles and memories, as well as pig snouts, which you track down by listening to their snorting and once shot with your pepper grinder yield you some kind of reward, usually in the form of teeth, which are the currency you collect to upgrade your four weapons, which aside from the Vorpal Blade all change in appearance the stronger they become, which is a considerate detail that I appreciate. The Vorpal Blade all too well illustrates how unfun it is to upgrade something and have nothing indicating that it is now upgraded. There's no visual fruit of your labor. It's just stronger because you know the programming of the game will now reflect that. As an aside, the complete edition of Madness Returns that I don't think is available digitally anymore, the one that included the original Alice, also included a DLC pack that unlocked some new dresses for Alice and a whole new tier of upgrades for your weapons. By default though, every copy of the game technically has these. You just have to go into the game's files to the part that asks if you're playing the complete edition and change false to true. So I didn't see any of this shit until right now. And let me tell you, that wasn't missing much. The Octo Grind is pretty, pretty legit. I, I'm a fan of exploration, so I do enjoy hunting for snouts and utilizing Alice's shrink sense, where she shrinks down and is able to see hidden passageways, as well as invisible platforms and little messages and hints left for her. Maybe this was a play on words with like, like she's getting small, because she's shrinking, but also a shrink like a psychiatrist. Or it's possible that's uh, some uh, dumb shit I made up. These are fun. The one thing that kind of bugs me is all too often 
often you're given bottles as a reward for snooping around. And these don't have any kind of immediate effect that gives you any sense of accomplishment. They essentially unlock concept art that you can look at later, but everything else gives you something, like a snippet of the story or progress towards an upgrade. And the bottles seem like such a filler idea that was probably implemented for Xbox achievements or something equally meaningless. I can just Google, uh, let's see. Alice Madness Returns Art. Tasteful, please. I know what's out there on the internet, and this is not a character I am comfortable seeing sexualized. Thank you for your time. Stay goth. Stay gaming. God damn. All right, so once you've installed whatever spyware, keylogger bullshit that Origin is, you can start up Alice Madness Returns, which is one of the most unstable games I've played in a while. And I don't at all remember it being that way, so maybe it's a modern Windows thing or an Origin thing. But this game did not want to stay running for very long. And when it did, it wanted to have a wildly fluctuating frame rate, weird input lag, and a number of strange bugs that I've never encountered in another game. Sometimes it would just hold in place for a second and then come to, usually when I was mid-jump. Uh, maybe it's just a hidden feature that the game would have the tendency to crash as a dramatic means of getting you to take a break. It's very Nintendo in that way, giving you an out, making you ask yourself, should I do something else with the rest of my night until you remember uh, that this is all you have. Sometimes I feel like I don't know how to properly quantify graphic quality from this era. This is in part because I don't often think about the way games look as some kind of scale of good to bad, and I'm generally more concerned with does this game display an interesting art style or sense of design, and by that criterion, I'd say this is still a great looking game. Each area is stuffed with whimsical odds and ends poking out of every corner, almost like Wonderland is built from the clutter of memories and thoughts, but each area's theme is an avenue of thought, sort of cordoned off and made into its own district, and even though I do appreciate the care and thought put into each of the five or so areas in Madness Returns, I do feel like it suffers because of the game's length, because you simply spend too much time in one area, and you start to lose uh, a bit of wonder, you might say. <laughs> you might <laughs> because of the- uh. Yes. I see. Okay. No, no. Thank you for telling me. Uh -huh. Yep, yeah, I'll I'll get right on that. Eventually, the seams start to become a little more apparent. Under scrutiny, you can notice some textures that just seem noticeably lower quality than others, like they haven't loaded in properly, which is a problem that will frequently pop up. Scenes will start with environments and characters replaced by formless blobs and then stutter into place. Looks nice once it renders, but now I can't get the thought out of my head that what I'm looking at is a thin veil, a mask set atop an amorphous nightmare. Are any of these visual goofs gonna sway my opinion? opinion that this is a very pretty and charming looking game? No. Did I need to include them in this video? No. Alice's penchant for fun visuals is a big reason I'm here, and a big reason I'm so spellbound by it. Even when I got a little bored towards the end, I would often just stop to inspect some weird bit of the environment and say, mm, yes, but what does it mean? Perhaps that we're all... Something that's always captured my imagination about American McGee's Alice was the map you filled out as you completed areas of the game, and the sort of illusion that Wonderland was interconnected in this way. So I always imagined an Alice game that took that map and made it traversable as a series of hubs. So it's I guess you could say open world, but I always thought of it as more of a Metroidvania type game where you bounce around to the different areas and unlock different parts of it with abilities or items unlocked in other parts. Madness Returns only enforced that desire by introducing the concept of the looking glass railway, which isn't a mechanic, it's just like a bit of world building, but there's already a fast travel system ready to be implemented. Just a thought for Alice 3. Uh, also, American, while I'm pitching, if you could uh, do another stage where you become tiny and walk around a, a tiny world, I fucking love that shit. Make me a little dude that walks around big things that are normally small. Maybe I get smashed by a giant pair of heels. Uh oh. 
Don't open that door. There are a couple bits of visual flair that I found very impressive for the time and honestly still look pretty neat. Alice's hair that not only reacts to movement but gusts of wind and steam. Very cool. There is a wild primitiveness to it, but it retains some charm. Newspapers will blow by in the wind and actually get stuck on you. Defeated ruined creatures leave behind black ooze that can be pushed around if you walk through it. It's a completely unnecessary addition, but it, it's fun and it looks delicious. Oh, I just, I just want to get one of those like boba straws and hoover that goo. Then I'll use the straw like a blow dart gun to just foom, 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 and vanquish my foes with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going insane. So I generally like the way this game looks, but there does seem to be some weird blind spots that bug me and really don't amount to more than you know, nitpicking. I think in general, I don't like the game's proclivity to just have something pop into the environment with no fanfare. Like when you find one of the snouts and there's a cutscene that shows you your reward uh, and there are audio cues that you've accomplished something uh, and then just you go. Character models for both NPCs and enemies are all a complete delight to me, towing the line between lovable and creepy and lovably creepy. I especially love that they all get a little introduction cutscene, and that they all for the most part have a consistent design that is both part of the level's theme and also incorporates the ruin. There are a couple that feel like outliers, uh, like the wasp samurai guys feel lifted out of a completely different game, but so does much of that level. I mean, I get why it's there. This was, after all, one of, if not the first Western game to be developed in China for export, and this is a cute way of giving a, uh, a wink and a finger guns for Asia, but also it feels like that's the only reason it's here. But the others find fun ways of mashing together steam-powered machinery, doll parts, and black goop into fun variations. Both of these games have always had a fabulous sense of design for this sort of thing. So much so that, you know, you look at concept art and there will be the kind of crossed out ideas that they decided not to use for balance or whatever reason. But all of them are just as competently put together and would make complete sense just dropped into the game. All the voice acting is top-notch, and much of the talent from American McGee's Alice reprised their roles. This railroad's a bloody shambles. The stink is ferocious, light, blinding, the noise, hellacious... Oh, wait, Tata. I get the idea. A bad train. Susie Bran returns as the, uh, excuse me, iconic voice of Alice, but outside of gaming might be better known as Poppy from the British sitcom You Rang My Lord. Yes, he's alright at parties and playing the giddy goat, but when it comes to spooning he's a washout. Do you spoon, James? <laughs> Roger Jackson returns as the cat, who may be recognized outside of gaming as the voice on the phone in the Scream films. Do you like scary movies, Sydney? I like that thing you're doing with your voice, Rand. Sexy. What's your favorite scary movie? It's interesting that a lot of the voice cast it doesn't typically do video games. Like the voice of Dr. Bumby was in Spitting Image. So it, it leads me to wonder if whenever anyone produces something with some relation to Alice in Wonderland, if British actors you just clamor to have some involvement in it just for the honor. Uh, but it's a it's a great cast, and it was a surreal pleasure hearing many of them again. I'm a big fan of Chris Brenna's work on the original game soundtrack. I think that it's it's iconic, and it's been a controversial but integral addition to the f mix. Unfortunately, this time around, Brenna was too busy touring with a currently cancelled musician with an eponymous band name and two fewer ribs than most people. So he was unable to take full control of the soundtrack, though he did contribute one track called Wasteland that is a banger. The rest of Madness Returns soundtrack was handled by Jason Tai and Marshall Crutcher. I feel like where the other game's soundtrack went for something like tactile and childlike with actual toys and bits of voice, this one aims for a more subdued, somber atmosphere. Have I said atmosphere yet? Did I actually make it that far without using that word? That's 
gotta be some kind of record. There's lots of reverb drenched piano, xylophone, lots and lots of sad strings. It's certainly a little more traditional and matured, I guess you could say, but it does feel unique and recognizable in its own way. They frequently make variations on the melody of the theme song as well. It is really pretty. There are many tracks used that evoke some tension, especially ones used during combat where these big fucking war drums come in. A lot of it is really dreamy and sad though. The card bridge theme stands out to me as a one that just gave me a bit of pause with just how melancholic it is. It's generally a very listenable soundtrack even outside of the game. The only problem with that is that a lot of it was cleverly constructed to be loopable, so you could have these play in perpetuity. But when they distributed the soundtrack, they only included like the length of a single loop. So it's a 35 minute soundtrack made up of mostly minute long tracks. Thankfully, someone else has made available an almost two hour long deluxe version of the soundtrack that includes every bit of incidental music and slight variation of the more prominent tracks and it's a shame it's not the highest quality but it's still a lot of fun still a lot of beauty to be found in there it's very strange the things I respond to because I was listening to it while I made this video and maybe I was just angry at how much it crashed and how much grief it gave me but initially I thought I would be a lot more cynical talking about this game but listening back to this being in the moment with my memories I play it again. It's weird. I think I just want to be in this game more than I want to play it, if that makes any sense. Like, I just want to live there. And I think that's mainly because I have the mind of an unwell child and the body of a sickly child. I agree with most of the other reviews in the one star section, but there are worse games out there and I wanted to give it two stars, but no way is it four stars, the overall Amazon average. It does look cool. I played it about three hours. I might play it until the end just to see the different environments, but it isn't very fun to play. Very repetitive, not much additional wrinkles in gameplay in the first three hours. You have to play to a point where autosave kicks in. There's no way to just save the game where you presently are. I enjoy the Grand Theft Auto games, Scarf Face, Godfather, etc. Doom and Turok back in the day. Alice has endless jumping from one small stone to another, falling, starting over. Most of the time you have to double jump or triple jump. It's a PETA! <laughs> I also don't understand the M rating. Yeah, everything looks creepy, but it's all very cartoonish. I haven't come across anything sexual yet. <laughs> this might be a leap, but I'm gonna guess that based on the examples you've given of other games you've played that don't have as much jumping as this one does, you're not too familiar with the concept of game genre and that there are sort of categories of games that explore a particular kind of gameplay and theme. This is a game that does not belong to the open world crime action shooter genres. It's a whole different thing. You know how you didn't have to steal a car or take out a rival gang's kingpin? That was on purpose. And also, the M rating is there because y you violently dismember creatures, there's some profanity. Where's me money, you fucking spunk bucket? And you will come across uh, some sexual themes. That is coming. Uh, I, I hope that's not why you bought the game, though. Where's the manual? My first disappointment with the game was that there was no manual, and there was no notice that the game did not have one on the outside cover. When you open the game, Game, there was a piece of paper stating that the manual was included on the disc. That meant that every time you wanted to access the manual, you had to stop gameplay, go to main menu, select manual, try to find what you're looking for, and then reverse your steps to get back to gameplay. Very time consuming. The reason EA gave for this blunder was that it was trying to save paper. I guess they never heard of recycled paper. My opinion is that they were just trying to save themselves money. I always play my first game on the easy mode, and after I complete the game, I'll play it on normal mode 
mode. I got about a quarter of the way through this game on easy mode and got so frustrated I stopped playing. Most of the time was spent jumping from one object to another which was very boring and there were too many times you had to spend too much time on getting past certain objects or bosses. I'm not a great gamer, but I've gotten through most games on normal mode. In my opinion, this game was really not worth the $40 I spent for it. It was $40? It's not bad. When you don't even get a manual for your money. If you can get it for $10 or rent it, I think it would be best. You know, I feel for this person. This is a legitimate gamer complaint sealed in amber. I've been gaming long enough to see the decline of video game packaging. To have it begin with a big, beautiful box covered in art and full of supplemental material to a DVD case with the game and the manual, to a DVD case with just the game, to a DVD case with a slip of paper and a code on it, to nothing. To this day, there is this persistent feeling of emptiness when you open a piece of physical media only to see a set of plastic tabs sitting there with their purpose left unfulfilled. It fucking sucks, man. Oh, also, you should get good- Ah, Christ. I wish Alice in Wonderland had never entered public domain. I'm so stick of these bloody steampunk versions. You've seen one, you've seen them all. And this one is no different. The same predictable look that you've seen done a hundred times so far. Which leaves the gameplay, which isn't compelling. Here's an example of what I mean. I played about halfway through this game and then had to leave on vacation. In other words, I was interrupted midway. I guess you could have said that. When I came back, I was surprised to find it in my PS console. I had totally forgot I had been playing it. That shouldn't happen with a video game. A good game should compel you, even haunt you, while you're on vacation. This one is really just a bunch of annoying timed and jumping puzzles. It's like the creators had no other ideas than to do what we've all seen a jillion times before and we're all sick of. Worse. The game makes you pay for all these weapons, and then has it so they don't affect most monsters. The creators of this game, American McGee, is a drooling idiot who needs to be restrained and then flogged. I legit have no fucking idea what you mean by these steampunk versions. Like versions of what? What is this in reference to? I would not consider Alice a steampunk game. There is a level that is devoted to clockwork and vague machinery that seems to center around the production of tea. But the rest of the game does not look like that. There's a nautical level, a weird taxidermy world, a dollhouse, a creepy castle. There's, there's a lot of shit on top of the Victoriana that holds it all together. Also, I really question your treatment of mental health. This is the sort of thing the bad guys in this game would do. Game's too hard and too complicated. Seems like everything on PS3 is too hard and not fun. Video games are supposed to be about fun, not difficulty. I'm almost positive I've c come across this dude before on another game it, that reviews every game he's ever played with the same variation of these words. In any case, I think the phrase, video games are supposed to be about fun, not difficulty, is some kind of a one hand clapping riddle of an idea that I'm sure I'll be thinking about for the rest of uh, this sentence. Amazing game. Sadly, I haven't been able to play it because Mean got stuck trained, probably not going to get it, would like replacement please or money back and thank you. <laughs> My nose is bleeding. It's been a bit of a ride, but I come out the other side of this video having reaffirmed that I enjoyed this game a lot. It's got a lot of problems and it does not surpass its predecessor. It's not the ideal game I would have liked after a decade of actual waiting. Like I, for a long time, I anticipated this game and maybe part of me is stuck in this Stockholm syndrome infatuation, like I need it to be amazing, but I mostly had fun playing it and I'm just kind of in love with its world, its atmosphere and its music. There are moments of boredom and frustration even, but I feel like I could still idly jump back into it at any moment. I'd be okay with that. The story. I think is is very good. It's just told at this stuttering pace where it's like you don't know where it's going and then you get where it's going a little too quickly. But once it's all out on the table, it's quite effective and memorable even. The platforming segments are fine. There's just a bit too much of it. Same with the combat. Like all the programming is there. There is simply too much of it with not enough variation. I still think it's a wonderfully imaginative and fun, creepy looking game. Landing somewhere between, I don't know, Splatterhouse and and Pee Wee's Playhouse. I still want another one of these, but unsurprisingly, the future of the franchise has never been more of a tease. 
As of my writing this, EA is still holding the IP hostage, so American McGee has a Patreon set up to fund the creation of a design bible to essentially present to EA, as if to say, look all this could be a reality if you just let the dude that made this game make another fucking game. The whole process is sort of depressing in a way, because I mean, from what I've seen in these regular live streams he's done, it looks like they plotted out some really fun things to do and collected some beautiful artwork. I've, I've not always agreed with what seems to be Americans' priorities with Alice. The whole exercise of kickstarting to buy the film rights and I didn't give a shit about. Alice was a game and I just wanted another game. But it's quite clear that this guy still cares a lot about the series and is pouring a lot of love even into this document outlining what he wants to do with a third game. Like I desperately want EA to have a temporary lapse in idiotic malice just, just to see this get made and even though it's once again been a decade, I'm still concerned that he'll throw in the towel with Alice. In 2013, American McGee and Spicy Horse wanted another shot at Oz, and began a Kickstarter for a game called Oz Zombie, presumably because some shadowy third party still owned the rights to American McGee's Oz, and because nobody took a moment to stop and say, hey, so why are we naming this the worst name we could think of? In a video detailing their hopes for Oz Zombie's Kickstarter, American McGee appears bound with an explosive strap to him put there by crazed fans of the Alice franchise who only want another Alice game and have to be convinced to support his new venture. Which like, that that ain't me, dude. I've been a silent bitter fan my whole fucking life. Unfortunately, this Kickstarter did not reach anywhere near their goal of $950,000, a number that was meant to include the film rights for American McGee's Alice, but this turned out to be one of the project's many undoings. So Oz Zombie was scrapped, and after the release of a few mobile games and a free-to-play title, Spicy Horse dissolved in 2016, with American choosing to focus on creating indie games through Patreon. New projects, you know, like a third attempt at an Oz game called Oz Adventures. Gotta say, I got love for the guy. He certainly sets his mind to something and makes big moves to see them happen. Nothing but respect for that. Uh, but the announcement of this and a TV series tie-in sounds real familiar. The worst part of it is his sales pitch for this one sounds pretty fucking cool. Like the idea of an Oz that acts like a Bermuda Triangle that brings together disparate characters across locations and across time sounds like a lot of fun. And without donning an Alice outfit and pressuring a creative fellow, I hope something he sets out to make gets made. I empathize with having an idea you desperately want to see brought to light. So I hope he gets to make something because I'm ready to game and my standards are real fucking low right now. End of the video time. Thank you for watching the video. Uh, I hope you, I hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it's so long. I, if it was short, I'd prob probably be saying sorry it's so short. So I'm just sorry. If you'd like to support my channel, you can look in the description for links to my Patreon and a, bun a bunch of other stuff. Twitter, Discord server. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. You should check it out sometime. But thank you again for watching my video. It means the world to me. By the way, I was just watching it with you right now. And uh, there's like a bit where I buy some uh, pirate's booty. That wasn't an ad. I feel like I structured a bit to look like an ad, but I really just, uh... you know what? It is an ad. It's a free ad. I'm kidding. You know, I wouldn't stoop that low. Jesus Christ. I want you to watch my video, not so much ad. <laughs> Please sign up for my Patreon. <laughs> anyway, thanks again, and an extra special thanks to Ailing Uncle, Two Password for Kids, Alexander Smith, Alexander Sundin, Andre Perkins, Aubrey, oop, I mean Audrey. Audrey Horn, Bayard Brown, Ben Carnell, Pizza Shift, Charles Marr, Daphne Pittendry, Dark Raptor 86, Dos Days, Edward Avila, Fart Mother, Game Master, Goaty McGork, Jacob Sewers, Jay, Jay Alamine, Joseph Zanoni, Carrot, Karen Mayville, Ken Dog, Marcus Chani, Moonpix, Nekot the Brave, Newstime, Octo, Oisto, Resurrection, Ruibisomem, Salvatore Tosti, <coughs> <coughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Seven. Stuka Bliat. This deal is getting better all the time. Turts. Wayne Bristol. Whip it out. XX Dark and Streams fan. XX. Ava Nerve. Giraffa. Jesse Briscoe. A Hanging Chad. Rosuf Jones. Donut Stalker. Dubs. High Food Court. Ishanji. Mad Monty 98. Mirden Emrys. Nafiz Hook. Ophelia Fishwife. Petera Bach. P. Dizzle, Persian Air, Robert Brandon, Samuel Ward, Sergei Vorontsov, Saab Akaduka, Technica, About Blank, Alistair Stewart, Alexander Ulbrich, Andrew Light, Big Honk, Bishy93, Brendan McFadden, Brett Weaver, Brody Gibson, Dan Cullen, Daniel Streb, David Frumke, David Harpstreit, Dazed Clockwork, Example Username, Faith Nowlin, Fickle Pickle Jar, Haley Bobella, Hitoshi san, Jake Desi, Jake Raynor, James Bloom, Jaron Kemp, Jordan Balzano, M, Mandalore Gaming, MCR, Miles Phillips, Mystical Lint, Name Requires DLC, Nick Timmons, Nork426, Ombud, Opichi Kostra, PWs, Quinn McElroy, Robert, Roland, Simon, Spooky, Stever, Swood Operator, Teeth, The Teeth, Teeth, Teeth. Travis Houston, Tyler Robinson, 4 Hour Depression Nap, Adam Page, Adrian, AI, Alas Ratgunk, Alec Dye, Alex Theodorov, Anarchy Parrot, Andre Kalganov, R Attack, Ariana Snoswell, Eris Alessandrakis, Arminius J, Arshis Knight, Austin Scott, Beardicus, Ben L, Ben Saxon, Ben White, Benjamin Judah Phelps, Big Cheese 1000, Binary Vision, Bindle, Blatherius, Boris Rombolt, Brendan Naftal, Byron Callan, Calavera, Cal May, Cannon Go Boom, Cat Hands, Chris Jordan, Chris Tallarico, Colin Boyd, Colton Rowe, Kami Hog, Commissar, Crispy, DS Carmen, Delaminek, Dan Richardson, Daniel Person, Dark Cloud 402, David Quinn, David Offord, Declan J. Keen, Demenza's Gate, Der Commissar, Dilda, DJ Necroman, Doxapine, Dre City, Edward Crawford, El Jazguar, Enzo, Ursandro, Fazy, Fix My Brain, Fred Grison, Gokujo Drops, Greg Buchold, Greg McKee, Grimbeard and Neryl are my two dads, Homeboy Dirtbag, INTJ loves her INTP, Evo Zap, Jay Marshall, James Young, Jared Siri, Jean Philippe Malouine, Jessica, Joe Jameson, Joe Face, Jojo Evans, J Raptor, Justin Stewart, Khalil Corey, Keith Pitt, Chris Odie, K S, League of Struggle, Leland Miliokis, Lorelei, Lost Via Domus, Lucas Kettner, Major Millions, Mangy Mongrel, Marcelo Camargo, Matt Bastard, Megan Carmody, Meme Queen, Micah J. Best, Michael, Michael King, Michael Pelican, Mike Garza, Mocha, Mr. Sark, Mr. Bujangles, Q Chan, Nameless, Nicholas Nelson, Nick Hill, Nikita Denisov, Nuan Sonar, Olympus 3DX, Omar Yid, Otter Soldier, Papa Perk. Pen Knight 89, Petrus Montanu, Philip Woolley, Ross Armstrong, Rowdy Rowdy Peeper, Roy Gendron, Scoss 117, Sean, Sean Clausen, Sergei Vidovin, Saidi, Smokey Jefferson, Sonata Fanatica, Spider, Steinuel, Strakin Yaradenkovic, Sweet Pete in the Hey What's Up Every Guy's Grim Beard coming to you here live with another gameplay commentary, Sidney Steverson, Terranism, The Mighty Noob, The Sleepiest Sarah, Tino Richter, Totally Not a Mim. Trenton Wilkins, Turbo Bra, Tyler Long, Vargar, Vivitis, Full Pix Chick, Xanax OD Grindcore Lover, Ya Boy Nikki G, Yak Spiker, Yves Yang, Zachariah I Am, Stianek Benez, Zin, Zubertuber, Oh fuck. <laughs> alright, alright, Arshal Markusen. Ugh, apologize in advance for that. Advance, I already said it. I apologize for that. A perfectly normal human and definitely not a dog that learned how to use a computer. AJ Leroy, AL Carpenter, A Bonkers Chicken, Adolency, Adrian Facci, Adventure Game Geek, Alex Hanna, Alexis Pinsenalt, Anna Emilia, Anthony Daniel, Austin Mathis, Baker, Big Hubert, Brad, Brian Sanson, B. Southby, Kanem, Kaz, Christian Danny Storgard, Christopher White Schneider, Creepy Lounge Lizard, Krylar, David Moreau, Drenched, Drunk Taco, Fabulous Freckles, Games Brit, Gargantua, Gato Malo, Ghost LPs, Half Asian Viking, Harry Sykes, Hashi Singh, Hinchis, Homeboy Dirtbag, Huai Li. I am here for darkened streams. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ignacio de Guglielmi, IP68, Isabella Stoner, Jeep Pete, Joe Reynolds, Johan Cavand, Jonathan Becker, Jonathanis Eddy, Josh B, Yoni Niamela, Wabuctus, Kakun, Kevin Thurber, Cramping Newt, Laz Lau, Lucas, Level Zero, Matthias Waltman, Melly, Melon, Yaragar, Nicholas Monroe, Niles Crane 19, Odd One Indeed, OK Cat Dad, 
Peach, Pedro Costum, Phony Soprano, Piotr Sankowski, Professor Nex, Pixelfish, QTP2T, Ricky Goss, Ricky Rigatoni, Rotten Hams, Sam C, Schluff, Sean McDonald, Seaway Jerk, Sentient Turtle, Sir Tristan, Silvano Gonzalez, Sinan the Montoya, Sir Alohomora, Slava Saknienko, Slavic Dreams, Snow Lame, Solar Box, Stephen Laflame, Sven Grell, Sinoise, Syruprise, Tatami Guy, Test Dunn, The Becker Sattler Clan, The Gaming Beehive, Little Bee, The Real Call L, The Voyant Claire, The Magnificent Spud, Timothy, Uncle Dozer TV, Val Halverson, Valinora, Venetian Red, Vincent Cronin, Visitor Information, Warhopper, Whiskey Grenade, Your Patron, Yuko Vallis, ZJ, One Iserlo, Alberto Viraljaras Ferreira, Alex Army Bull, Alex Yui, Allegory, Anna Trans Rights Exo, Andre Kurnkov, Anthony H, Astro Shepard, Azroy, Bertigan, Bertie Bertig, Big Death Energy, Bit Matter, Bloodworth, Bimbizzle, Bo, Boy, Bones Malones, Brandon Shock, Bubblegum Kirapop, Buckaroo, Cabbage, Cam, Chalabard, Chef Toker, Chonko Ronko, Chris Barb, Cine Selena, Cloister 56, CMG 161, Conrad Eastman, Cryptid John, Daniel Gen, Daniel Newberry, Danny D, Dantec K3, David Badzinski, Dead Alewives, Damar, Dezu, Deveth Faust, Dust Sucker, Edmo Filo, Edward McQuinn, Edward Wheeler, 82 Pedro, Emilio Hansen, Emmett Arthur, Epic Dude 467, Eric Leong, Eric Lawn, Eugene Balder, Ava Grave Ladova, Fitzgerald 93, Florian Vogel, Fubar Gubbins, Frank, Frantic Atlantic, Freaky Demon, Franz, Gianni Matragrano, Gideon Joubert, Guy, HL Longboy, Hamish Batten, Hannes Jacoby, Hazel Connor, Hymos Statman, Hufflerand, I Faw Down, Ian, Ian Baranek, Ikifu, Incorrect Beans, Inside My Strange Place, Jacob Hanley, Jacob Gardner, Jalcor, James Lambert, J Dog 3433, Jick Magger, John Adams, John Brumley, John Kamich, John Stone, Josh Hessler, Joshua Cam, Joshua McLarnan, Joshua Stewart, all oh my Joshes, Justavian, Khalifas, Casey Ghoul, Kamiya, Kirano, Kyle Williams, Lafazar, Lara Harwood, Lauren, Lauren Miller, Leonardo Antonio Aquasanta, Louis Quinwalen, Low C, Lucas Mendel, Lucas Gasway, Lynn Lovett, Magna Dick, Malifrena, Manu Weidman, Mara Elena, Matt Chester, Matthew Arrowwood, Mijuin, Metal Crew, Michael B, Mike McMuscles, Mikey Tambourine, Mojave Jade, Moral, Mungo Jerry, Nagru, Nate Blanchard, Nathaniel Dolinchuk, Negative Creep, Nick Johnson, Octo, Oliver Marshall, Pagan Butler, Pentagon Black, Perennial Astronaut, Farce Face, Phoenix Flames, Frand, Piotr Skubawa, Poet Russell, Pommy, Popeyed Bark, Prod Mage, Putty God, QL 2040, Quirky Top Hat, Rachel Rose, Rasmus Karras, Raul Vidal, Razzle Dazzle B13, Red Arcade, Reflect, Rayo Palmiste, Ren, Ruben, Robert Chernovsky, Robert McMahon, Robert Scotland, Roosevelt Hoover IV, Ross Carmona, Ryan Malone, Sam Fuller, Sam Each, Sammy 3D, Sarah Denman, Scott Valine, Sean Bradford, Sean Lovett, Sean Tiva, Snail85, Someone Finally Pays Me, Stanislav, Summer Storm, Sweeneasy, Tayano, Sandman, That One Guy, This Sid 4, Thyroric, Tony Brandt, Tony Gleed, Saurus, Unpolished Mirror, VK, Van the Cheesen, V, Viet Do, Vigo Love, Vinculus, Vlad M, Fukrules, Wendigo, A Fear Worth Living, Water Under Rock, Webgoth, Who Done It, Widukind, Will M, William Riker, Walrek, Zan, Extreme Steve, Yasarian, Yuki Cyan, Zachary Schulstad, Zane Brake, and Ziklau for being a patron. I am endlessly grateful for all your support, and I hope you're all doing great. That's it. Just uh, don't die. And uh, I'll see you next time for what may be my 100th video. I'm sure I've already reached 100, but, you know, not including ones I've uh, deleted. 100. And I couldn't have done it. I wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. Goodbye. Sure.